Well, I hope your Christmas week was great uh, and your New Year's was celebration was fantastic. How many of you actually stayed up till midnight? Yeah, me neither. Yeah, yeah, that is, that is, that's old school. <laughs> I don't do that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a fuddy-duddy and I'm proud of it. I go to bed. My sleep is more important than that. Uh, or maybe I should just think of it, this is a random thought, maybe I should just think of it as on New Year's Eve, I'm going to live on Eastern Standard Time. Then if I go to bed, I'm already there, right? Because, you know, two hours, so whatever. Random thought, sorry the mic was on. Uh, but Happy New Year to you, and uh, I am glad that you are here. I have been looking forward uh, to sharing this message with you for a couple of months uh, now, and uh, today we are going to talk about the Blitz, uh, and specifically the first quarter Blitz, uh, indicating the first quarter of the year. So well, first of all, first question we have to answer, obviously, is what is a Blitz? Uh, for those of you who are not sports people, especially, uh, actually not football people, because you can actually be a sports person and not have any clue what a Blitz is, but that's, that's where it's used predominantly in our culture. But the term blitz was made famous uh, in World War II uh, by the English because of what the Germans were doing to them. The Germans would use a tactic of warfare called the Blitzkrieg. Uh, and the Blitzkrieg uh, was a fast uh, and overwhelming assault uh, against the enemy. Uh, in fact, uh, it is defined, Webster says, defines Blitzkrieg this way, a war conducted with great speed and force, a violent surprise offensive by massed air forces and mechanized ground forces in close coordination. Uh, and so Blitzkrieg, uh, and it was a highly successful method of warfare for the Germans early on in World War II. But we are no longer in the 1940s, and we are now in an age of military conflict where people are playing video games, you know, thousands of miles away and dropping bombs on people. It's weird. It's surreal. But blitz, uh, if you hear the term blitz, you're probably going to think about football. Oh, and this is a fun fact for you. Here you go. Did you know that fish blitz? Like, here's, the, here's a, a later definition uh, of blitz. An occurrence in which large numbers of fish gather to chase and feed on prey or bait. So, if you're wondering what that might look like, uh, not in the water, but outside of the water, think of the cruise. Okay? Great animated movie, right? And remember when, they, when they're, you know, making their way because the cave is no longer uh, an option and those, those, those fish, those birds uh, come up and they start circling around that big fish that's not in the water. Yeah, I don't know how that works, but anyway. Uh, and then those fish just descend on that fish and leave nothing but a skeleton. Blitz! Uh, and so piranhas, I think, would be a fish that would practice the old blitz. Um, so that's just a fun fact for you. When you're talking about fish uh, with somebody this week, drop blitz in there in an aquatic sense and... See what they think of it. They might think you're impressive. Uh, and then they might not. They might not even care, which is fine. Blitz is a football term, and we hope today that the Grizz blitzes in the national championship game are highly successful because it's going to take a miracle and then some for the Grizz to beat the Jackrabbits. We understand that. Uh, but uh, a blitz is a highly effective tool uh, for a defense in football. And good teams know when to blitz, and they know how to blitz. And so when a football team blitzes, they are using all those elements, surprise, speed, and what you want from a blitz is for it to be overwhelming. So essentially what you're doing is br bringing more people after the quarterback to disrupt the play than there are blockers to protect the quarterback. And so I always enjoyed a successful blitz against Tom Brady. I all, I, Steve, Pastor Steve told me I should have provided a compilation of every time Brady was sacked, and I thought, I missed it. Like, we could just be watching that right now with great pleasure. Um, it's been a great year without him on the field, by the way. I, I, I just, I can't, I'm sorry. Uh, 
But when I talk about blitz in our context today, what I'm talking about is, is using that metaphor to describe what I would like to see us as a congregation do to the enemy in the first 100 days of this year. I wonder if you're ready to blitz. And I hope to inspire you today and motivate you to contemplate it, to make a, an educated decision so that you will join what we're calling the blitz. Because here's what will happen if we will blitz as a congregation. If we'll blitz the enemy, you know what we're going to get? We're going to get kingdom wins. And there is nothing more important on planet earth than kingdom wins. Nothing. Nothing's more important. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 28, verses 9, or 18 through 20. This is what we call the Great Commission, right, is right before Jesus ascended into heaven. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, there's just a ton in there for us to love. But that's where we get our mission from, and that's why uh, we put it in a statement here at New Life. Our mission as a congregation is to show people the way to life in Jesus. If you don't get life in Jesus, you will not go to heaven. Jesus is it. If you try to get to heaven by any other and in any other way but faith in Christ, you will miss heaven and go forever to hell. That is the gospel. But God loved us so much that he made sure we have the opportunity to choose him. And Jesus makes it clear. He says, go into all the world. Now, our portion of the world, central Montana, thank you, God, for dropping us here and not in the Mojave Desert or, you know, some other weird place with nothing to look at. Thank you, God for the call to central Montana. When we get to 1 Thessalonians in the New Testament, Paul had done what Jesus said before he left the earth. He had gone to Thessalonica. He had made disciples. He had baptized them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he wrote to them because he was impeded from getting to them. And so he said, I got to send them a letter. Would to God that Paul would have had email, but he didn't uh, back in the first century. And so, so he, he wrote them a letter, 1 Thessalonians, uh, where he talked to them about what was happening to them, about what he was desiring for them, and all of those kinds of things. But what I want us to do today, we're going to focus on chapter 2, verses 17 through 20, and I want us to use this, these, these few verses to kind of frame what we're talking about today and how uh, we're talking about this, this blitz that I am proposing today. Now, here, here's what it says, uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 17. Dear brothers and sisters, after we were separated from you for a little while, though our hearts never left you, it's like Brenda when she goes to Minnesota to see her family without me. She leaves me, but she wants to be with me. Mm, so good, so good. And I with her, praise God. Anyway, where was I? Here we go. Uh, we tried very hard to come back because of our intense longing to see you again. Those are the kind of people you want to have in your life, and that's what everybody should experience when they enter a local church. This, this, is, a great, this is a great litmus test for us. Now, we're imperfect people. You know, churches are often you know, chastised for being filled with hypocrites. And that's because it's full of humans. There is no human who is not in some shape or form a hypocrite. So we just simply say, join the rest of us because God is redeeming us. He's helping us. He's sanctifying us. He's changing us from the inside out. We wanted very much to come to you. And I, Paul, tried again and again. And then listen to this. But Satan prevented us. Have you ever wanted to do something for God, but Satan prevents you? Satan's not the only one that will prevent you. And we'll get to that in a few minutes. But Satan prevented us. After all, and here's, here's what I want us to zero in on. After all, what gives us hope and joy and what will be our proud reward and crown as we stand before the Lord Jesus when he returns? It is you, 
the Thessalonian people. Yes, you are our pride and joy. I love Paul's heart for people here. I love it. He wants to be with them. Why? Because they were going through some tough stuff. And he wanted to be with them. He wanted to help them. He wanted to encourage them. But Satan, and we're not sure how that happened, but Satan had prevented him. So he writes the letter. He eventually would send his protege, Timothy, uh, to them. Uh, and so he was doing everything he could to get to them, to help them. But, but here's what I love about 19, verses 19 and 20. Paul reiterates to us what Jesus was talking about. Why should we go and make disciples of all people? Why should we implore people to serve Jesus? Because people are the only thing that will make it to eternity. Don't live your life for anything that this world has to offer. Live your life for what God has to offer. And what God has to offer is eternal life. And Paul said, I came to you and I, I, I gave to you the gospel. You surrendered your lives to Jesus. And when we stand together before God, you're the reason. You're, you're the reason that we're going to exalt. You're the reason that we're going to have joy because you have, have, you, you have become a part of the family of God. Now, at the beginning of February, they're going to hand out the Lombardi Trophy again. The Lombardi Trophy is the uh, most coveted of all football trophies. It's not the most coveted trophy in sports. That unequivocally belongs to to Lord Stanley's Cup in, in the National Hockey League. There is no trophy worldwide that is more coveted than that one. But in American football, the, the, the most coveted trophy is the Lombardi Trophy. The Super Bowl winner, not necessarily the best team, but the Super Bowl winner gets to take home the Lombardi Trophy and be crowned champions. And they're going to celebrate it. And you know what's going to happen on the Monday after the Super Bowl? Probably on Tuesday after the parade. Everybody's going to forget who was the champ, and those guys that just won that trophy, they're not going to enjoy it because they got to get back to the grind because that's not enough, because it doesn't satisfy, because it's empty, because it can't fill their soul, and they're going to go after it again the following year. It's a gerbil wheel. Paul says, when we go after people with the gospel you'll never experience that. Because when people come to faith in Christ, that is an eternal reward for them and for us. That is powerful. You are a trophy. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are a trophy of the grace of God to this world. That's pretty cool. Like God puts you on display. And he's like, hey, check this out. Let me tell you the story about this trophy how I transformed him, how I changed him, how he was a knothead and a knucklehead and full of garbage and filth and, and, and mistakes and all that, but I changed him. And that's what Paul is saying. And so, in central Montana, we know that there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people, probably close to 10,000 people across the Tri-County area who don't even want to be in church. So what I'm saying there is there's a deep, deep, deep pool just in our lightly populated small area here in central Montana. Do we want to reach them? Do we believe that Jesus gave his life for them and do we want to be obedient to Jesus and seek them like he has sought us? That's the question that we have to ask ourselves. If we're going to do that, I would, I would say that one of the ways that we can do that is by doing things like this, this blitz for, for a, a small portion of time. Speed, overwhelming pressure on the enemy, not on people, on the enemy. For what? To communicate the life-saving gospel of Jesus to those who are living in darkness. Is there any better way that I could spend my time? Is there any better way that you could spend your time at work? Then by living your life, not even necessarily using words, but showing them the way to life in Jesus. That's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. And what an opportunity that we have. Now, obviously, when it comes to a blitz, one of the reasons that defenses will do this is to, they, they want to, they want to get off the field, they want to get off the field so that their offense can come on the field and try to score some points. 
When a team dials up a blitz, they, they want to get off the field. Because if you can keep the offense off the field, you increase your chances of winning the game. Because the offense is how you score points. So get off the field so that you can use some offense on the field. I would propose to you that there's a couple of things, very general things, that we first need to stop doing before we can ever blitz the enemy and get some kingdom wins. There's a couple of things. Now, Paul, Satan, prevented him. There's a couple of things that we do that really help Satan. And sometimes they're so subtle, we just forget about it. So there's two things we need to stop doing so that we can position ourselves to blitz. Here we go. First of all, stop playing defense. Stop playing defense. Far too often, I play defense spiritually, and I think you do too. I think more often than not, this is our position against the enemy. We're just hoping to God that we can withstand his attacks until we get to heaven. That's defense. I'm not sure that that is the will of God for the people that he called overwhelming conquerors. And we spend so much time trying to protect ourselves. And I want to say to you today that if you have been playing defense spiritually, change your mindset. Stop playing defense and start playing offense. Stop playing into the devil's hands. I watched the Buffalo Bills, praise God. Hallelujah. I love the Buffalo Bills. I have since I was a boy because I remember being at Grandma Forseth's when the color TV was fuzzy. And I would ask Grandma, can I watch TV? Yes. And I was watching the halftime highlights, which used to be a whole lot better than they are now. And I remember, I think I was six or seven years old, the Buffalo Bills were at home and their red, white, and blue jerseys were there. And I said, I like their jerseys. That's my favorite team. And I have suffered greatly as a Bills fan through the decades. <laughs> greatly. Oh, greatly. I have suffered greatly. But a couple of weeks ago, they played the Dallas Cowboys. My brother's favorite team. Now you can really tell there was a dissension in the home in the 90s. And the Buffalo Bills took that vaunted Dallas defense and they ran the ever-loving football down the throat of the Dallas Cowboys time after time after time after time. After. And I was texting both my brothers. <laughs> it was so awesome. It was the first time in the history of the NFL that that's ever happened. <clears throat> that's what I want from my spiritual life. I want the devil to line up with his vaunted power and his vaunted demonic forces and his vaunted intimidation, and I want the devil to know exactly what play I'm going to run. I'm going to give it to that guy right there. Now, go, and I want to run it down his throat. Do you know that Paul talks about that when Jesus died, he publicly embarrassed Satan. And I think that is part of the Great Commission, that when we make disciples of all people, we are helping God embarrass the devil. It's time that we stop Get The devil needs credit because he is more powerful than you. But he's not more powerful than God, and the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. It's time for you to stop playing defense and begin to play some offense spiritually. Stop watching TV and start praying. Stop reading romance novels and start reading the Bible. Stop memorizing sports statistics and memorize the word. Do some offense. Stop playing defense. And secondly, if we're going to blitz, we got to not only stop playing defense, but number two, we have to stop being selfish. This is really, really subtle. One of the most selfish things you can do is pray for revival. Because you know what we do as good church people who pray for revival? We stand in a little circle. We pray that God will pour His Spirit out. And we don't do anything else. Do you really think that Jesus is going to show up and do your job? Go to work. Look for opportunities. 
talk to people, show people, live a life that is godly and holy and different than the world around you. Show people the way to life in Jesus. We need to pray. I am not saying don't pray, but I'm saying it becomes selfishness when all we do is stand around and ask God to pour His Spirit out. He is ready to do that, and we are unwilling to go to people who don't smell right, who don't look right, who don't have the right address, who aren't at the right income level. That is absolute, pure, and unmitigated selfishness. And we got to stop being selfish. Paul talked about this to, to the Philippian church in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Listen to what Paul says. He says, don't be selfish. That's pretty clear. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your interests, but take an interest in others too. How many of you have a hard time being interested in what other people are interested in? Raise your hands. Come on. We're in church. Yeah. Sometimes that's so hard, especially in marriage. I look at this little craft I just made. Doesn't that look great, Ken? Yeah. Fantastic. It's fantastic. And on the flip side, hey, babe, you see the veins on that arrow? You see how straight they're, huh? Oh, yeah, whatever. Juvenile examples, I know. But our selfishness gets in the way so easily. And Paul told the Philippians, he said, listen, stop being selfish. And Jesus is the prime example, which verses 5 through 8, take, take on the attitude of Christ who, although he was God, being in the form of God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself and humbled himself to the point of death on a cross, Paul would say. That's how you be humble. You serve other people. You, you, you stop thinking about you. You know, one of the best things for my bad attitude is when I get my attention onto you. How many of you know that's true? When you got a bad attitude, when you got a negative attitude, when you're a sourpuss, one of the best things you can do is just turn your attention to somebody else and serve them. It's so true. And if we are going to effectively get some kingdom wins and blitz the enemy and overwhelm him, we've got to stop playing defense all the time and we need to stop being selfish. Staying in your comfort zone is a selfish thing. And now I have primed the pump for what I am about to deliver in what I call the blitz. This is going to make you uncomfortable. There are three, three initiatives here that go with this blitz, and I'm not asking you to pick one of three. The blitz will happen only when you choose all three simultaneously. That's the overwhelming part. It is, it is overwhelming. We want the enemy to fumble the ball. We want the enemy to turn it over. We want the enemy to get sacked. We want him with the grass in his face mask when he gets up out the field, right? I mean, come on, man. That's what we want to see. But far too often, it's we Christians who are picking ourselves up off the field. Stop playing defense. Stop being selfish. You'll be positioned to do what Jesus said. Go into all the world. Make disciples of all people. And like Paul said, be able to effectively say, God, the crown and the glory and the joy that I want to find is in showing people the way to life in you. Here's what I know, friends. You being a part of New Life Assembly will never New Life Assembly does not have the power to transform your life. I do not have the power to transform your life. But we know somebody who does. And if you'll hang with us, we will show you the way to life in Jesus. And he'll change your life from the inside out. It's not about new life. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. And God gave his church and he gave Christians as gifts to the world. Ephesians is very clear, Ephesians chapter 4. And so, let's blitz. So, here's how we're going to dial this up. And believe me, blitzing is going to make you uncomfortable. It'll make you so uncomfortable that in thinking about these things, I didn't, I was like, God, can we do something else? <laughs> like, I, uh, uh, I was like, come on, man, <laughs> really? Because it makes, it makes me uncomfortable. And so I just want you to know, you're in good company. Blitzing is going to challenge the status quo in your life. Blitzing is going to shake things up in your life. Blitzing like this 
is going to make you more like Jesus. It's going to test the motives of your heart. It's going to position you to see God do things that you never thought that you'd see God do. Blitzing is going to mean that that people are going to repent of their sins. Blitzing in God's name is going to mean that people are going to be baptized as a public demonstration that they are followers of Jesus. That's the power of overwhelming the enemy. And God has given us his power. His spirit lives within us. And so let's do something that we maybe haven't done for a long time. And let's spend the first three months of 2024 blitzing the enemy, lining it up and dialing it up. The defensive coordinator is blitz, blitz, blitz. The enemy wants a break on first down. Don't give it to him. He wants a break on second down. Don't give it to him. He wants a break on third down. If it's third and 26, get to the quarterback and make it fourth and 40. Do you hear what I'm saying? Because this is how we get to where Paul was. I want to I see people transformed by the power of God. So that when I stand before the Lord, I can say, God, thank you for the people. We spend so much of our time as Americans bless, blessing and thanking God for his blessings. There is no greater blessing than people that you will lead to Jesus. Because people are going with you to heaven. Everything else is staying here. How about that? People matter. So, here we go. Initiative number one. Invite one person to church over the next three months. Now, some of you are really, really good at this. I've watched it. I've perceived it. And I have thanked God privately for it. There are so, How many of you are here because you were invited by somebody from New Life to, to come and be a part of New Life. Anybody here? Yeah. There's a few of you. Yep. Okay. How many, how many of you know, uh, remember Dick and June Griffin? They were the champions of this. Every week they were bringing somebody. Who's this? Oh, this was our waitress on Tuesday. They went out to eat all the time. You know, uh, this was this was so and so. Or I know this person because they were my doctor's nurses. You know, blood taker person who ran the computer. Like what? Yeah, I mean, it was just always meeting new people. Why? Because Dick and June understood something. They understood that while they didn't have all the answers about God, they understood that getting people exposed to God's people was a way to show them the way to life in Jesus. Invite one person over the next three months to church. Now, that doesn't mean that they're even going to accept your invitation. If you want to take this a step further, invite people to church over the next three months like you never have before until they start showing up. If they say no, then pick somebody. You know what I mean? Like I say, we're probably close to rough estimate, about 10,000 across central Montana who don't even go to church. They're not thinking about God today. And we're wondering, who can I invite? Who who can I invite? Don't you invite somebody from another church. You invite somebody who's far from God. Let them come and experience the presence of God. Let them experience the, the people of God. Let them experience the brokenness that's in your life, that's in my life. Invite one person over the next three months. Now, uh, the church trainer group, uh, in an article entitled The Power of an Invite, uh, here's some statistics for you just about how powerful this is. What in it, when people were asked what initially brought you to church, 6 to 8% of people walked in on their own initiative. 6 to 8%. 2 to 3% liked a program that they offered. So the kids' program was good, so they came to church. Um, 8 to 10% liked the pastor. I really wish that number was higher. <laughs> but it's a single digit, man. It's horrible. So it's not me. All right? Uh, three to four percent had a need met by the church. So maybe some church people took them a meal and then they decided to come. Uh, you know, uh, one to two percent were evangelized. You gave them a tract. And because of that tract, you know, they, they came to church. Um, three to four percent were attracted by Sunday school. Uh, uh, which kind of goes with the program thing, 70 to 85% were invited by a relative or friend. And more specifically, the average is 83% of people who are connected to the life of a local church, not just, not just on the fringes of a church, but they're connected to the life and the ministry of a church. 83% came because they were invited by a friend or a relative. That's amazing. How did Jesus 
choose his disciples. He did not ask them for resumes. He did not seek out their political affiliation. He didn't ask them what they did for a living. He invited them. That's pretty powerful. And we just need to be kind and be friendly. And I mean, if you're a sour puss, invite them to new life. And when they say, why would I want to go to a place where there's people like you? Just say, oh, they're not like me. That's why you want to go. Right? Like just figure, be creative, you know, be creative and figure it out. So invite one person, invite one person over the next three months uh, to church. Number two, connect with three families at three meals over the next three months. And more specifically, connect with three different families over three different meals over the next three months. Maybe people aren't ready to come in on a Sunday, but they'll be ready to come have dinner. They'll be ready to join you whether you go out to a restaurant and eat or whatever. But And don't choose the same people and don't choose your family. Choose people. So if Brenda and I uh, were, were to do this, it might look like, uh, uh, you know, i got to get some names here that aren't going to be offensive. Just a minute. Jack and Jill. So Jack and Jill, they might be the first people that we choose. Uh, and then John and Jane. Are, are, the, are the next ones. You know what we're going to do in February? We're not inviting Jack and Jill and John and Jane because we already invited them. They might be invited somewhere else, but what we really hope is that they'll invite some people maybe to join them for a meal. What are we doing here? We're not even witnessing. We're not even sharing Jesus, but over a meal, we're showing them the way to life in Jesus by just being friendly and kind like Christians should be. So have some meals together. Connect. You know why? Because your story is important. These are great opportunities for you to say, tell me more. Tell me more. And that's the kind of culture that we want to create here at New Life. Connect with three families, three different families, over three different meals over the next three months. You say, oh, pastor, that's so hard. Well, then don't blitz. Get it ran down your throat. I am, I am pushing you. I am telling you to prioritize some kingdom things in your life over maybe some of the other things. I am tell, asking you to make a difficult decision with your time. If you don't want them hanging out because you're, you're afraid they're going to hang out or whatever, make your house messy except for the dinner table. People, aren't, people don't like being in a messy house, but they'll come in and they'll eat and then they'll leave quick. It's a little trick. Uh, or <laughs> just meet them at a restaurant. Just meet them at a restaurant and do that and connect. So invite one person to church over the next three months. Secondly, connect with three families at three meals over the next three months. And again, this can be church people or it can be maybe one church couple that you're a little more comfortable with and then maybe some people who aren't serving Jesus yet. You know, you you can really get creative with this. And then number three, tithe from one paycheck over the next three months. Now, this is, this is absolutely aimed at those of you who, who uh, are not in the habit of giving regularly. The tithe is a biblical, the biblical model that God has given us where we return to Him what is His, and that is the first 10% of our paycheck. So tithe. So if, you may, if your paycheck is $1,000, you give the first $100, the first and the best, you give that to the Lord before you pay any bills. Okay? Why? Because God said He'd be our provider, because God said He'd come through, because it is a test God. It's the, only t- it's the only thing that God ever said, test me in this and see. Now, if you are a tither, I am not letting you off the hook. I am challenging you to take that amount. If, if your paycheck is $1,000 and so the tithe is 10%, $100, I'm challenging you over the next three months to tithe or to give an addi- the additional amount of a tithe. So instead of giving, you know, if you got paid twice a month, For three months, you'd get six paychecks. I'm asking you to give the total of whatever that would be of seven paychecks. Why would you do this, Ken? Because this is about your heart. This is about your spiritual life. This is about you becoming more like Jesus. This is about you learning to be a generous person. And listen, friends, I got a great... I am the kind of guy who will pray for paychecks. or, Or not paychecks, who will pray for checks from people. And they come. I'll give God amounts. God, I'd like to have this amount from this person. Sometimes he doesn't use that person. But do you know that we were, (laughs) it happened again in December. 
I had been praying in September and October and November. I said, God, got some financial needs. I got some financial needs. I'm not, I, I mean, give me more work if you want, but God, I'm asking you for, for checks. I'm asking you for checks. You know what I got in the mail? I got a check for more than I could ever ask or imagine. I was like, what the cat here? God answers prayer. And you know what the first thing I did with it was? That's right, I tithed on it. Boom! Because that's what I've learned to do because God doesn't fail me. And this is something that you'll only learn as you do it. Some of you say, I can't pay my bills. Well, then there's bills, obviously, that, <laughs> that are about more about you than they are about God. But I'm just telling you, listen, give, be generous. You want to be the kind of person who practices heart-stopping generosity. I would love to be in a position in my life And I do have an aim to get there. I don't know how it's going to happen yet, but I've wanted to do it for years. I want to be able to identify people just subtly and be able to just go buy them a vehicle and then drop it off at their house and say, this is for you. How cool would that be? That would be amazing. Why would you do that, Ken? Why don't you buy yourself a new one and and give them the, the older one? Well, because that's not what God said to do. What is it that you would love to do in terms of generosity for other people? Tithing is a great place to start because God promises us in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9 that if we have a desire to fund his kingdom, he will always make sure that there is seed in your bag to go and sow into the fields of ministry around the world. Awesome. Invite one person to church over the next three months. Have three meals with three different families. Over the course of the next three months, three different families, three meals. Yeah, I think I got that one right. And then tithe from one paycheck. And, and hey, if you're, if you're not a tither, let me just tell you, do, just do it with this one. Do it with the next one that comes. Just get it over with. Just, be gen- do, do, just get it over with now because you don't want that generosity thing to start taking root in your life. You, you really don't. I mean, come on now. Uh, yeah, it's all good. You know what these things are going to do? They have eternal impacts. And we know that from the testimony of Scripture. And we know it from the testimony of history. Friend, God has more for your life than what you're experiencing. And what a great... Don't you want to start 2024 with some kingdom wins? I mean, yeah, the wins at work, they're great. The wins in our relationships in life, those can be great. But man, to overwhelm the enemy, wouldn't you love to stand together in this room at the end of March and be given God the glory for what He has done over the first hundred days as He has laid the enemy to open shame and ridicule because of the power of God through the willingness and the obedience of his people. My goodness, it's time to dial up a blitz. Don't drop into dime coverage and play prevent. You're going to lose. How many times do we see that? Team goes into prevent defense. Just, oh God, just don't let the devil get another one. Forget that. Line up on the line. Don't give them, just don't play two deep safeties. Get up there on the line of scrimmage and let the devil see you coming and what you promise, don't you back out of it and you go after him, you overwhelm him, you overtake him for the glory and the power of God. You do that? If you do that, you like Paul will stand with those people that God has touched through your life and your willingness to blitz. You will stand in eternity and say, this is my joy and crown. Wow! How amazing might that be? I want to see God move in central Montana. I am uncomfortable. I am so glad I got this off my chest. Because now some of you are uncomfortable along with me. On your Connect card, on the back there, you can see it. Today I'm choosing to receive Jesus as my Savior for the first time. Or maybe it's I'll stop playing spiritual defense. I'm joining the Blitz. Or maybe it's I'm going to stop being selfish. I'm joining the Blitz. If those fit, if, the, if you need to mark the other one and, and give us something else to pray for this week, then do that. You can drop these uh, into the giving boxes on your way out uh, today. If you'll just drop those uh, in there, uh, we, will, we will be in prayer with you. I am joining the Blitz. I'm doing it. Because I, I want... 
I want to start with some wins in 2024. And winning means overwhelming the enemy through the great and awesome power of my God and your God. Will you stand with me today? Jesus, as we prepare to leave this place, I'm so excited for those who have it in their heart to join what we're simply calling the Blitz. It's just three simple things, Lord, that seem really kind of unspiritual in some ways. Uh, Three things that stretch us, they make us uncomfortable. But God, I'm I'm okay with that because I want to take the risk. I want to dig the ditch. And I want to see you do exceedingly abundantly far and above all that I could ever ask or imagine. I pray, Spirit of God, that you would stir the heart of New Life Assembly. And I pray, God, that we would start this first quarter of this year by seeing kingdom wins, by beginning to have conversations about faith. That's a win. By beginning to see people surrender their life to you, that's a win. By by seeing people's lives change, not from the outside in, but from the inside out. Lord, I ask and pray through the inner working of your Holy Spirit, that we would be the willing people to be on the line of scrimmage to storm the gates of hell as we approach your soon return. And God, I pray that we would not be found being lazy or being in a prevent mode, but I pray that we would be doing your business until you come. And may it all be for the glory and the honor of your great and strong name. Amen. Amen. Set, hunt, blitz. <laughs> there you go. God bless you as you go today.